Namaste Adab, hello to everyone in various time zones from all over the world. A warm welcome to you on behalf of the Indian Diaspora of Washington, D.C. I'm Shanti Chandra Shekhar, a member of the Diaspora. And as uh, Dr. Razi Raziuddin, our host, mentioned, I'll be, um, I'll be giving you a short welcome address today. The topic for this Saturday's event is Majoritarian Nationalism and the Crisis of Democracy in India. And to talk about this important subject, we have with us Professor Debye Shanand, along with two more distinguished speakers. Professor Anand has been the head of the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Westminster in London. He is also the co-chair of the Black and Minority Ethnic Network at the university. Expanding upon the key insights of his previous book, Hindu Nationalism in India and the Politics of Fear, Professor Anand will outline the various ways in which Hindutva today, as he sees it, is the single biggest threat to the possibility of democracy in India. The opening remarks will be presented by Professor Monajit Chatterjee, an honorary professor of economics at Harriet Watt University, UK. Professor Chatterjee has also been the fellow and director of studies and economics at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, and at Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. He's held several positions at universities in different countries. And if I have anything wrong about any of the speakers, please forgive me. To present the concluding remarks, we are honored to have with us, hopefully by then she'll join us, Sunita Vishwanath, who's been an advocate of women's rights and human rights. Sunita Ji co-founded the International Women's Human Rights Organization, Women for Afghan Women in 2001. In 2011, she founded Sadhana and inspired the Hindu Americans to blend their faith with social justice and human rights. As many of us know, Professor, uh, sorry, President Obama honored her as a champion of change in 2015 for her work with Sadhana. Then in 2019, she co-founded the Human Rights Advocacy Group, Hindus for Hindu, for Human Rights. Over to Professor Chatterjee now for the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Shanti, and welcome to everybody. Uh, namaste, Adab, and good afternoon if you're in Europe, good morning if you're in America, and good evening if you're in India, because um, we all live in different time zones. So I'm very grateful to Razi for asking me to give the introductory remarks. Uh, and I'm hoping what I will do in that is to A, introduce the topic a little bit and also introduce our main speaker. So uh, probably a good place to begin is with Mr. Nehru's famous words at the Red Fort at the moment of independence, uh, an occasion at which my parents were present. Of course, I wasn't born then. Um, and of course, that is the long years ago we made a Trist with Destiny speech. But what is this destiny to be? At the time, I think many believed that the destiny for which so many had struggled for so long and with so much sacrifice was to be a multi-ethnic, inclusive, pluralist, liberal democracy. Getting rid of imperialism was only the first step on this long road. It was not an end in itself. The preamble to the constitution declares that the people of India have willed that we shall be, and I quote, sovereign, socialist, secular, and democratic republic. Now this vision of a secular society was of course rooted in our own traditions and history. Mr. Nehru again in Discovery of India uh, writes, it was India's way in the past to welcome and absorb other cultures. The eminent historian Percival Spear, now late departed, described India as a sponge absorbing uh, waters from all directions. And despite some setbacks, I think this vision was the dominant paradigm in India right up to the 1980s. The destruction of the Babri Masjid in 1992 was to herald the start of a new era. In my eyes, this was the beginning of the muscular Hindutva on a large scale, culminating in the government that we have, that we have today. 
Uh, how did this happen? Where are we going now? How do we understand this phenomenon? And how do we combat it? To help us with this, thinking about this, we're very fortunate today to have as our main speaker, Professor Dibesh Anand. Dibesh has been associated with many leading academic institutions, starting with his BA at St. Stephen's College in Delhi, through his MA at Hull University, his PhD at Bristol University, various appointments abroad in the US. His major appointments in Britain have been at Bath University, and now as head of school at Westminster University in London. He has moved between and across disciplines with accomplished flair, refusing to be boxed into the silos of conventional academia, where we are constantly told, you know, you're either an economist or you're a historian or you're this or you're that. Uh, we, but that is not the way in which society actually functions in these silos. But there are some constant themes, despite this hopping across disciplines, there are some constant themes running through uh, Dibesh's multidisciplinary research work. It's permeated by what I call, an, in what he calls, an engaged ethicality that is meaningful to all, but particularly meaningful to those who are marginalized or suppressed. He's published many articles and an extremely important book called Hindu Nationalism, India and the Politics of Fear. Now, the subject of Hindutva has been written about by many, but what Dibesh Anand particularly focuses on in his analysis is the politics of fear and imagination. And where do these come from? His invention of a new political term to describe this ugly phenomena is porno nationalism, which is a truly graphic description of what we are witnessing uh, and a word that I truly like. And with his permission, I shall plagiarize it and use it when I talk as well from now on. But he also warns against a simplistic understanding of Hindutva as an intellectually bankrupt idea, which is a delusional, illiberal attack on secular, multi-ethnic, pluralistic India. We must understand the enemy and his source of strength to defeat him. So, and Dr. Anand is much more than just an academic. The themes he works on are so important that a wider assimilation is needed. And his skill and enthusiasm as a teacher finds expression in his many attempts on social media to take his message to a wider audience, despite the trolling and whatever that comes with it. Activist, thinker, communicator, researcher, one might truly say that he is a man for all seasons. Professor Anand. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chatterjee. I mean, uh... And I'm humbled by what you said, and of course, uh, I'm humbled by the fact that Razi and the organization, they invited me to have a discussion around this very important subject of majoritarian nationalism and the uh, crisis of democracy in India. Now, we can try to be very polite and we can say, okay, what we India is experiencing is what many other countries are experiencing. So take example of Trump phenomenon in the US, you know, right-wing populism, take example of Erdogan in Turkey, take example of Philippines, you know, Brazil. So, there's nothing unique in India. And to an extent, that's correct. A lot of people have worked on similarities between these kinds of movements. But the fact that there are other countries experiencing similar things does not in any way reduce the crisis that's very much in the world's largest democracy. Right? So I'll start with that. So again, in terms of the book that was mentioned is this book, which is Hindu Nationalism in India and the Politics of Fear. I would suggest don't buy this book. It's for free. What I have done, of course, illegally. I put it for free on academia.edu. It's a proofread version of the final version. So if you can find it easily, find it. If not, just Google for my name and name of the book. You'll find free link via academia.edu. You have to register and get it. Now, when this book came out, by the way, in 2011, and when I was writing this book, so I'll tell you what prompted me to write this book. What prompted me to write this book? And by the way, I'm not my expertise was in China and Tibet, and that's still my main expertise. So I looked at the ways in which Tibet was imagined in the West, to what extent it helped Tibetans and also harmed Tibetans. So China was my main focus and Tibet. 2002 happened, uh, anti-Muslim pogrom in uh, Gujarat. And what I would come across even amongst, and I was in England then, but what I would come across even amongst liberal Hindu Indians, I said liberal in inverted comma, was something like, yeah, you know, what happened was not good, but you know, these Muslims, you know how they are like. So often there was this stereotype that was marshaled. And I recall a particular train journey 
that I had taken from Patna where my parents were to Delhi. And I was sharing a, uh, the cabin with someone who was, by the way, a retired uh, Supreme Court judge, right? And he said, and I'm the, I'll not name, but he said that, you know, these Muslims, wherever they are, there's a problem, right? And this is, uh, this was, by the way, this chief, no, no, he was not chief, this justice was supposed to be a good Hindu liberal. So what I found, of course, was even when including amongst my relatives, thankfully not immediate family, relatives, these casual things about, you know, these Muslims, they are already the problem. So there was a, how to say, blaming the victim mentality. Now, as someone who identifies as a feminist, and of course, who has been aware of various ways in which women are told, and including women who are victims of gendered violence, including rape, are told that you deserve it because of you went out at night. You deserve it because you wore a short skirt. You deserve it because you went out with a strange man. You know, So I'm very much aware of that gendered logic. So I could see similar gendered logic here where there was a blaming the victim mentality. Now, so that's it. Now, of course, the readings I had done was largely by people like myself, I would say, which is broadly on the left of the perspective. Those who are critical of Tanika Sarkar, Romila Thapar, you know, I've been reading their work and I find them very interesting, particularly Tanika Sarkar's work. And yet there was something that made me restless that when I read the works of the critics with whom I identified by the way, right, as scholar, I could still not see that there was almost a sense that these Hindutva people, you know, the Chaddiwalas, and, you know, we all, often make joke about you know, the khaki chattiwala and, and a lot of time you'll find people, including myself, will make fun of them. And there was a fun. And I was thinking, we are making fun of them, but they do come to power, right? And they have power to an extent. So for me, the key thing was, how do these, and I said, look, how do the people who are Hindu nationalists imagine, I mean, how do they see themselves? So, right, so that's the question I had. So I went and I went and started researching apart from books and articles, leave that, right? But basically, I went to Ayodhya first. That was in 2005. I went to Ayodhya uh, around December 6th. Now, December 6th is when uh, Babri Majid was brought down. So in Ayodhya, they used to celebrate every year Shaurya Divas, Valor Day, right? The, to celebrate. And, you know, recently you would have heard, if you bother to follow her, what's her name? You know, Kangana Ranawat, you know, the film uh, actor. She said how the 1947 independence was peak while Azadi, so somehow people begged for freedom, the true Azadi is 2014. What she essentially says, and you know, you may, again, we may laugh about her that she's somehow, you know, illiterate, arrogant. She's not. Because I would say that the Khaki Chaddiwalas, the RSS ones, you know, people make fun of, they're even less dangerous than these Gucci, whatever, the, I don't know what uh, clothes they wear, right? Be it Kangana Ranaut or Arnab Goswami. The Arnab Goswami kinds are more dangerous than the Khaki Chaddiwala because they're exactly the same, even though they might be speaking in English and they might be wearing other dresses. So what I'm trying to argue is that the, there was a certain image and imagination of Hindutva people as those small town boys and small town men who are simply frustrated. They have no jobs. So if only they get educated, then they will become like us. Now, so that was it. So I went to Ayodhya on December 6th, spent time there, and I spent time, by the way, I spent time with who there was then the head of Ram uh, Jan Bhumi, you know, the, basically the, uh, the temple construction, uh, the movement. I met them, I spent time with them, I stayed in Dharamshala, right? Now, I have to say, I, did say I, did, I didn't lie at any point, I would not. But I would not, cannot give the whole truth, which is basically, I'm, I, I find the whole Hindutva to be abhorrent, right? So that I didn't say, I just said that I'm from England, I'm a scholar, I want to understand your views, right? So that I was true, I wanted to understand the view. So that's how I did research. It, it was Ayodhya, then I went to Haridwar. Haridwar had a particular Dharam Sansad of BHP, which was Hindu Parishad. Then, of course, I went to BJP office in Delhi. Then I went to BJP office and BHP office in Bombay. Then I spent time in Ahmedabad, uh, including BHP offices, right? So, and then Nagpur, of course. Nagpur is, as you can imagine, that is the headquarter of them. So what I found was, of course, most of my time was spent with the grassroots activists, as well as leaders, but mostly grassroots activists, who are mostly men, right, of Bajrangdal and VHP and RSS, right? So these are the three organizations. And this is a time, by the way, when BJP had lost power. Congress has come to power. And this is the time when people were almost writing off, and I recall uh, newspaper articles in India, which wrote off BJP, that what BJP was done was a blip, 
and essentially India has a strong democracy, which is a secular democracy, you know, and they can't come back to power. I'm telling that's how it was seen, right? So I worked on it. So my argument, and I'll, I'll tell you, my essential argument here is that Hindu, and I, when I then did the book proposal, I wrote articles, book proposal, you know what the first reaction of the reviewer was, and before the book was even published, they said, oh, it's of an exaggeration. What, what I'm saying is that I'm looking at a freak phenomenon, that's the term you, a freak phenomenon. I'm somehow exaggerating the dangers posed by this organization, which in any case is a small organization, hardly anyone pays attention, and they cannot make difference politically. That was a reviewer, by the way, I've kept that email. And I'm sure it was some scholar. So I was forced to change to an extent the language where rather saying Hindu nationalism, I kept saying Hindu Twa nationalism. No, but I remember at various points, various scholars telling me that Hindu nationalism is a minority phenomenon. India is a safe democracy. Yes, it will, they will remain in, you know, come to, they might not come to power, but they'll hear, but India cannot change. Look at India, you know, you have a Roman Catholic uh, politician, you've got Sikh Prime Minister, you have Muslim president and all of that. You know, we, we are familiar with that kind of rhetoric. That book, I wrote the book. And even then, what I would say is, I could sense the lethality. So that's why I said lethal, lethality and explain the concepts I use here. But even I would not have expected the rapid ways in which India has black backslided in terms of democracy. So even I wasn't expecting that it would be so quick. Right. So at various points, I did write that in a Hindu nation is the biggest source of insecurity in India. Because if you look at Indian uh, discourse, and this is from secularists also, by the way, not only Hindu nationalists, the discourse would be, what are the threats to India? Islamic terrorism, Kashmir, Naxos, right? And remember, declaring Naxos to be the greatest interior threat was a Congress thing, not a BJP thing. Now, for me, I mean, at every point, if, if anyone pays attention, that India is a democracy. In constitution, there's no mention of nation. Nation doesn't exist in constitution. It's democracy that exists in, uh, in, in uh, India. The very idea of India is supposed to be what Monajit earlier talked about, a certain kind of, eth eth not ethnic, but certain kind of civil, civic, nationalist, pluralist uh, India. So the biggest threat, very obvious, would be a Hindu nationalism one, right? And yet, even secularists at various points in time underemphasize the lethality of Hindu nationalism. And I would argue that they underemphasize the lethality of Hindu nationalism because to a great extent, even secular nationalism of India had a strong element of Hindu nationalism. The difference would be that Hindutva are all out and the secular nationalist aspects of it is what people could call soft Hindutva, but also an opportunist Hindutva. So it is also pander to um, Muslim chauvinism, they pointed to Hindu chauvinism, they pointed to all kinds of chauvinism, it was more opportunist one, right? Now, the title I gave today, and I'll come back to book later, but the title I have given is uh, Majoritarian Nationalism. So I'll explain for you, I mean, what, what, why I call it Majoritarian Nationalism. So Majoritarian Nationalism is not about na nationalism of the majority. Majoritarian Nationalism is the idea that the nations could, should speak for the majority, even if the majority doesn't want it. So in Indian context, majority nationalism, which is a Hindu nationalism, would argue that given India is, a, India is a Hindu majority, India ought to be a Hindu nation. But India is not a Hindu nation. So what should be done? We have to transform India from whatever it is, secular nation by constitution, into a Hindu nation. Right? So the idea is it's a majority nation. And they come with the whole idea that they are supported by the idea of democracy. And I'll come to democracy later. But they believe that a democracy is majority rule. So why should India not be a Hindu nation, given that India is a Hindu majority? So look at Pakistan. Pakistan is the Islamic Republic. Look at you know, any, many other countries, the Islamic Republic. Right? They make the right point about Pakistan. So Pakistan is a Muslim uh, majority nationalism. Right? But the fact of the matter is, from the very beginning, Pakistan said it's going to be an Islamic Republic to an extent. Right? Of course, there's a discussion between, is it Muslim majority, Islamic Republic, or is it a uh, land for all Muslims? They have their own debate. But if you look at 1947 onward, at least in early decades of India, it was very clear that India was meant to be, a, even if secular was not used in the constitution, it was supposed to be a secular nation because the promise was made to Muslims and Christians that they all will be equal citizens in theory at least, even if not in practice, right? At least in theory it was there. So Hindu nationalists argue, so Kangana Ranawat in that sense is not an outlier. She reflects the thinking of majority of Hindu nationalists. 
So in Ayodhya, going back to Ayodhya, where you know I was doing research, they would always say, Asli Azadi ye hai. By the way, they were using the word Azadi. Then sometimes they'll say Swatantrata, right? So they will say, this is the Freedom Day, Valor Day. So, they, uh, so 6th of December, you know, the, uh, the destruction of Babri Majid was a Valor Day for them. That was a true Independence Day for them. Why would they see it as Independence? Like the way Kangana Rana was seen in 2014 as Independence? Because for them, you have Muslim invasion and imperialism. Then you have got British imperialism. Then you had a secular imperialism. A secularist, and I'll explain what their concept of secularism is, secular imperialism. So it's only the Hindutva and under Modi, the Asli Mard. And Asli Mard, I'm deliberately using that term. So in 2002, and when social media was not rampant, we have to be, how to say, we have to be grateful that social media wasn't rampant then. Otherwise, imagine how horrible the social media discourse would have been then, right? So he was uh, promoted and in, in, the, in, in the Yahoo chat groups and other places uh, as Asli Mard. So Modi was seen as a real man. Why was he seen as a real man? Was it because he was very respectful to women? No. You know what he has done with his life? Not at all. We know what he done. Is he a slimite because he's a macho figure who, you know, is, I don't know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, a Sylvester Stallone? No. He's a slimite because he has shown Muslims their real place, which is that you do not deserve to live as equal and we will show you your real place through violence. Right? So that's the a slimite. So the notion of masculinity that Hindutva has, as Monoji earlier pointed out, a muscular notion of Hindutva, right? So a muscular notion of Hinduism that we are strong to, and I'll come back to it. So majority nationalism, therefore, is the idea that because India is Hindu majority, it should be Hindu nation, right? But what is Hindu nationalism? How should it function? So RSS, if you look at RSS website now, and if you speak to most of the RSS people, they would argue that we are a cultural organization, we are a social organization. So to me, during my interview, they'd always say that, no, my, I wasn't professor then. And by the way, so my name doesn't give my caste away, right? If you look at my name, the B.H. Anand, you can't guess my caste from it. Now, and they always try to identify what my caste would be, and I would not give that, right? The B.H. Anand. And I always pretended to be a bit, you know, naive, then I'm living in England, you know, that kind of thing. But of course, they assumed I'm Hindu, which I'm not, because I gave up my religion a long time ago, but they assumed I'm Hindu. Uh, so they would always say that, look, we, we are into cultural transformation. We are into social transformation. And they are. So the main purpose, the way they operate the Hindutva is that the first notion is, and I'll give you examples of how they did it and how they do it now. Cricket. Cricket it seems to be an obsession for many in subcontinent, right? So what they would do, in, and they said, this is how they said it. So they, look, in my book, what I've done is I've not gone to any critic of Hindutva. So I've not gone to Tanika Sarkar and, you know, uh, uh, Thapar and others to then make an argument in Hindutva. I've used them from time to time, but essentially I've relied completely upon Hindutva actors themselves. So the leaflets they produce, the booklets they produce, the manuals they have. So what they did was, they would say cricket, right? So they will be a young man around 25, 28, 30, early in 20s. So they will watch a young boys playing cricket in small towns and village. They'll go and watch them play. Then they'll call them so what are you playing cricket you play cricket that's good but do you also think of mother india right so they said they may say yes no whatever they say, chalo, chalo, ajao. so come over and i will talk to you about mother nation good keep playing cricket but come and join me also and then this charismatic young man would almost groom these young boys and i'm using the word groom deliberately by the way right because if you know the uh, language of child abuse to an extent, that's the language I'm using here. So they'll to groom the young boys to say, please, uh, basically, you play cricket, but Mother India. Ka bhi Aapko pata hai dushman hai aapke. So do you know who your enemies are? Then, of course, now they are having ice cream, they are eating something, and the, you know, the bara bhaiya, the big brother is telling them something, and they think big brother knows what he's saying. Say, no, your enemies are, of course, Muslims, the Christians. Your enemies are communists. But they don't know who the Christians are. Uh, Christian, there's no Christian in the village. They know some Muslims, but they are poor. They don't matter. They know they don't know who the secularists are, right? So then they will say, you know, you look on television. The television, you see people who are getting everything in life. They are the secularists because they are pro-Muslim. So secularists are those self-hating Hindus who do not respect the idea of Hindu nation, right? So they start grooming. Then they will say that you know you play your cricket, but you also unfold the flag. Which flag will they unfold? The Bhagwa Dwaj. Sometimes the Indian flag also. So I'm giving one example, right? So what they would do is they would mobilize. So that's cultural mobilization, social mobilization. Then they 
say, you know, well, you have your religious festival. Why are you allowing your Muslim friends to come? They say, but you know, they're my friends. I play with them. No, you can play with them, but never trust them. So keep them out of your religion. Do they invite you for their uh, namaz? Do they invite you to the mosque? They don't, right? So you should not invite them. So the language, you see, so what would they would do is cult, there would be a project of cultural transformation to make Hindus in their notion a pure Hindu, right? So that's what the culture, social transformation, boycott. Don't go in, why are you eating with Muslims? You know what they put in, they spit in your food. They do this, you know, they eat beef. You see social transformation, cultural transformation. So politics. RSS would often tell us that they're not political organization. They say, we don't care about BJP. We, it's not us. I mean, we, we, we support anyone who supports the Indian Hindu nation. And they used to say that at that point in time also, not now. They, uh, the mask has come off. But they would say that politics is reluctantly they'll engage in politics because you have no option in but to engage in politics in order to achieve your wider aim, which is of Hindu nation. So essentially, they're nationalists who want Hindu nation. Therefore, to achieve that Hindu nation, apart from social and cultural transformation, what they want is political control control over the state. So the entire project of Hindutva is not actually a project, okay, it's a political project, but it's not a party political project. It's a project to transform the common sense in India, right? So if there's one thing you have to bear in mind, it's common sense. The common sense being that, what is India? India, heck yeah. Is it a plural nation? Is it a Hindu nation? And they have been to a great extent successful in transforming a common sense in India. So, uh, how do they do it? So they would do it, but and I've discussed it in a book and I've discussed it in various lectures and I can do that during question and answer maybe, right? Uh, so they would buy a lot of importance I would pay, pay to representation, imagination. Remember, we're dealing with not a battle on the street. We're dealing with battle of imagination to an extent, right? So the imagination representation would be, they are, they used to say five, they say basically they're four enemies of Hindu nation. Muslim, Islam. They use the word Islam. Church. And I'm using the exact word, not Christian, but church. Islam, church, communists, and secularists. Right? So four areas. Yeah, Nasi, do you want to ask question now or do you want to wait? Ravi, I don't know what the protocol is. Should no, we'll wait toward the end. Wait, okay, that's fine. Ravi, you can, so Nazir, you can put your question there. I can answer that later, right? Or repeat it later. So uh, you have got uh, uh, Muslims, Christians, uh, communists, and seculars. Why are Muslims the enemy number one? So, and they would, these are slogans which some of you would be familiar with, and others who are not familiar with India will not be familiar with, and we can laugh about those slogans, but these are slogans. So I said, my source are all these Hindutva activists. Right? These young, I was also younger then, so these boys and young men will talk to me and they'll talk all of it. So I collected all of that and used that in a book. So Musliman ke Dohistan, Kabristan ya Pakistan. So Muslims have only two places, Pakistan or Kabristan, right? So good Muslim is either a dead Muslim or Muslim who has been expelled. So the recent phenomenon where you hear of, they will say, go back to Pakistan, not go back. So go to Pakistan, right? There's an old phenomenon, right? So the idea is Muslims have no place here. Why are Muslims threat? Again, I have explained an entire chapter there. Muslims are threat because they're Muslims, because Quran is uh, X, Y, Z, because Muslims have a conspiracy to Islamize India. Muslims have conspiracy to control India. Muslims are threat to our women. Muslims are threat to our society. Muslims are threat to our nation. So women, Society, nation. You see the connection. The nation, women, society all are merged into one. So the idea is, I'll come to what should a good Hindu do, right? So the idea is Muslims are threat. So they are the enemy number one. Pehle Kasai, Fir Isai. First the butcher, the Muslims, right? And then the Christians. And of course, butcher is a pejorative term they use for Muslims, all Muslims. Pehle Kasai, Fir Isai. These are all the same, right? And by the way, RSS would have all these not slogans, poetry competition. I, I attended, by the way, I attended one of the poetry competition in Nagpur. They wanted me to be the chief guest. And of course, I avoided being a chief guest. And all these young boys were doing poetry, which was all about hate speech, including the celebration of Savarkar and uh, celebrating the death of uh, Gandhi. So the idea is Muslims are threat. Now Christians are threat because they all of both are foreign. Right? But why are communists a threat? Because their also idea is foreign. So, but why secularists? Of course, because secularists are those self-hating Hindus who allow Muslim, Christian, secularists so much as say in India. But ultimately, what? so what should Hindu nationalists do? Hindu nationalists need to first recognize the enemies. So you recognize the enemies, right? Then what next? You recognize that the wider Hindu society is sleeping. So 
सोए हुए हम सोए हैं सो वॉट सी हिंदुत्व प्रोजेक्ट हिंदुत्व प्रोजेक्ट इज टू अवेकन दी हिंदू बॉडी एंड हिंदू सेल्फ एंड हिंदू माइंड सो यू फर्स्ट अवेकन द हिंदू माइंड हाउ डू यू अवेकन द हिंदू माइंड you do you know you preach everyone you know you go and tell people how a big threat uh, how big the threat is from muslim christian and secularist and communist you educate them so awaken the hindu mind then awaken the hindu body what is awakening the body hindu body is basically you do exercise you come together as a group then you you start using arms to challenge muslims challenge secularist challenge communist so you use wala so ultimately then what do you do so you have awakened hindu mind you have awakened hindu body so now you need an awakened hindu nation but that can is only possible from mind and body the tragedy of the secularists in india the genuine secularists in india has been i mean our failure has been i would say that we did not challenge hindutva when the awakening of the hindu mind was taking place we saw them as you know those rss chaddi walas who will not have much influence because you know they are somewhere in the villages they are somewhere in small towns and they are not there in du jnu wherever therefore they don't really matter we did not pay much attention to them until they also started awakening the hindu body right and then of course we had some writing that showed how they organize and by the time they of course awakened the hindu nation it was almost quite late now from hindutva perspective what is the awakened hindu nation the first example of awakened hindu nation is is 1992 the destruction of babri masjid and that is why they call independence day then the second example of awakened hindu nation is 2002 gujarat another independence day now the third example of awakened hindu nation of course then it becomes quite rapid after 2014 so the awakened hindu nation is that one that is muscular manly that says that because muslims and christians and seculars and and whatever okay muslims and christians pose threat to us and seculars and communists weaken our body right so they make us feminine muslims and christians are masculine and therefore the project of hindu nation is to identify the enemy awaken the hindu nation and fight against them so the violence against minorities violence against communists even violence against secularist atheists is justified as a counter violence so babri masjid is seen as a reaction to immense patience you know, in that patience of hindu nation was tested and again in my book and other articles have looked at how it was seen as hum kitna sabr karenge sabr was the idea that we are patient 2002 was we are reacting to what happened in a, uh, on the train so uh, modi seen as a reaction to the failure of secularism everything seen as a reaction and then they will say that there's a newton law by the way they don't might not know newton but they will bring newton law say it's about reaction so hindutva is projected as a reaction to aggressive muslim mainly and also christian forms of identity and failures of india because of secularism and communism so what we find of course is that there's a focus on representation there's focus on policy changing policy and of course since in last since 2014 it's rapid we see what happened with the not only the you know babri masjid i still refuse i will refuse to call it ram temple because it is a babri masjid which has been brought down there's also the love jihad thing i mean i don't know when you heard the concept of love jihad first i heard the concept in 2004 and 5 in my book which is 2011 i used the concept of love jihad because this concept of love jihad as you possibly we all shared this idea a conspiracy for conspiracy so it's a conspiracy theory spread by hindutva that there's a conspiracy of muslims to seduce our women and transform them so uh, which by the way i've discussed in my book so what they would say and they gave me very graphic story then that's why you know what monojit picked up the term i use for hindu nationalism is porno nationalism it's a pornographic form of nationalism it's a violent pornographic form of nationalism and why because there's an imagination of the muslim other the muslim male in particular which is seen as hyper masculine rapist seductive right so there are muslim men who are all these who are out there to seduce our women and rape our men and our women are very innocent so how does it happen that happens and they would give me example they would say for a dalit woman it would be 5000 rupee for a brahmin woman it would be 50000 rupee that somehow that uh, al qaeda would give money and they would say it by the way they would al qaeda is giving money to muslim men to then you know seduce hindu women and transform them and who supports him the muslim women muslim men in that muslim women so somehow they gave me story which i have mentioned here is the hindu hindu girl will become be friended sorry hindu girl will be befriended in the college university by muslim girl 
they become friends then the muslim girl will introduce the hindu girl to the her brother right and then the brother and the hindu girl will start having an affair and they'll do something they never word the word use the word sex they'll they do something and it will be recorded and she'll be blackmailed right and then it's gone so the idea is how do you, what do you do you essentially this is the love jihad and they use the word love jihad and at every place in every place ayodhya haridwar and nagpur at the other place i talked and uh, uh, in ahmedabad they mentioned how this is happening in our place and it's not happening anywhere else and we know this comes place was everywhere so what do you do you control essentially not only control muslim men which you have to and you don't trust muslim women you actually control hindu women so we see that essentially the majority in nationalism project is a project to control hindu sexuality hindu women it's based on which is what i said in my book is i have argued that it's not only fear of the other the muslim other imaginary muslim other right fear of christian other fear of seculars is essentially fear of the hindu self which according to them is not manly enough and therefore the project is to create a new hindu self which is manly masculine and violent right so what does why is it posing a crisis to democracy the reason it's posing crisis to democracy of course is because democracy is about majority rule minority rights and right to dissent without fear majority rule minority right right to dissent without fear now majority rule is not a majoritarian rule it's not an ethnic rule it's a political majority rule now what hindutva have done is they've used electoral democracy to consolidate power fine which is what hitler did in 1930 early 30 remember that and i always refer to hitler and the reason i refer to hitler and i've done that even on tv and after i've done on sky news here which is you know a television after that few news channels withdrew their politely withdrew their invite to me and this is when modi was visiting few years ago in england and i, and I, I said that because the news anchor said but you know mr modi is so popular isn't he i said yes he is very popular but remember in 1930 there was another very popular man and we know that's not democracy then you know then again i said but remember this erdogan and of course they understand erdogan's authoritarian personality he's authoritarian i mean modi and erdogan are the best brothers by the way i mean if you just pay attention the how they've distorted idea of democracy majority and everything but anyway coming back to this so what they have done is the majority rule but you cannot have a democracy without minority rights and right to dissent without fear now if you take example of india we know that minority rights are de facto disappearing so there is a conscious de facto disenfranchisement of muslims in particular now i am saying de facto not de jure de jure is by law so some will say but in india muslims are right muslims are this muslim that of course by law they have rights in practice how much right do they have so we have now again and again uh, that government coming to power that has not a single elected member of parliament who the muslim elected i'm not talking nominated ones in rajya sabha right so the reason i let you you know uttar pradesh uttar pradesh has a significant muslim minority population not a single Mus- elected member of, uh, from bjp what it tells us is that now in india you can have a political power part party coming to power that does not require muslims to stand in election so muslims can vote for them so someone will tell you that but you know shias are voting for my bjp somewhere muslims are voting for someone this muslim women are voting for bjp because somehow they feel liberated after that the triple talaq thing was done maybe maybe not maybe they are but i am reminded of the hafta thing which you would read in 90s and i think many of you of my age or you know our generation so we used to hear about the hafta you know the daud ibrahim kind of thing bjp is exactly that hindutva is a goon i mean a goonish party it's a goonish party because what they do give the option to minority that either you vote for us quietly and live under our protection or you don't vote for us and still anyway we are going to bully you right so but it's not an active enfranchisement and that's not democracy so what hindutva is doing in india is what basically it happens in pakistan that the muslims so where hindus and christians are meant to be protected remember democracy is not the language of protection minorities do not need protection in a democracy minorities require rights it's a right based discourse so the idea of protection which exists in pakistan which exists in many other countries is a language of protection that to an extent can exist in the hindu national project right so how can democracy be protected so one is through media media is supposed to be watchdog of democracy right media will challenge uh, uh, majority national for those of you or those of us following indian media we know how the bleak the situation is i mean you know they're going further to the far right 
So I'll not even talk of media as a watchdog there. The second would be uh, judiciary. Uh, to an extent, judiciary is still independent in India, but when it comes to when you look at uh, the NHRC, the, which is supposed to be Human Rights Commission, right, in India, and the language that the ex-judge uses there, the language used is one which says that human rights is essentially being misused against Indian nation. Again, the constitution does not use the word nation. I'm not aware that nationalism is part of the Indian constitution. Human rights are. Rights are, right? Fundamental rights. And yet we have a situation now where many learned judges, right? Most of them Savarna, most of them men, well, almost all men, are making pronouncements about how we have to balance between rights and the, somehow protecting the nation. When their duty should not be to protect the nation, their duty should be to protect the uh, rights of the people. So judiciary, let's see what happens. It's somewhere still in the, in the middle. We've got a state. State is meant to be neutral. So you take example of U US, right? Where you have Trump coming to power, Trump being very authoritarian, but you had still a state that was not always working with Trump, right? In case of India, if you take example, what Doval has been doing, what you know the Bipin Rawat has done in terms of military, there's a very active process to Hinduize the Indian military, which is largely a secular institution, right? There's a very conscious project to create India into a sort of a police state where police are being told that, what about your human rights, right? So that's there. So media, no. State, largely under the control, they have captured the state. Judiciary, I wouldn't say it's very independent, but there might be some hope there, here and there. Civil society. A democracy can only be protected if you have a strong civil society. Again, those of us following things in India, we know how civil society is under constant attack. Civil society is not weak in India but it's been constant attack. People being put into prison for years, not even months and months and months. Maybe they will get free after two, three, four years, right? But see, if they can do that to let's say, Omar Khalid and others who are prominent people, who people know at least, right? What it does, it, it provides a message to the wider population that if we can do that to someone who's so well-known, imagine what we're going to do to you. It leads to a very censorship at every level, right? Uh, Right, so media, state, civil society, judiciary, you could see there's a constant attack on that. I would say that the only hope in India still comes from electoral democracy because all the other wings are challenged. Because in electoral democracy, when we look at it, Hindutva or Hindu Nationalist Party fail to win majority most of the time election, in terms of vote, but they do win majority at center level for two elections. So I would still say that if we have to have hope, it is about mobilization of people for electoral purpose without giving up on civil society, of course, constant use of social media. Diaspora, and again, I think many of us are in diaspora. I mean, we know how Hinduized the diaspora can become. So the diaspora in the UK, at least some of you are there in the US, it seems you're more progressive than the diaspora here in the UK. Of course, there are diasporic Indians who are secularist, progressive and everything, but there's a significant section of Indian diaspora that have either gone quiet or become, oh, Modi ji, Modi ji, Modi ji, right? And of course, part of it is going quiet is, you know, there are real reasons. Our OCIs can get cancelled. Our access to family can get cancelled. We can be, so it's not only social media trolling, it's actually a very clear attempt that we know that, you know, what I'm saying here, it can easily be used to threaten my access to my family in India. And in recent times, I mean, someone who's quite prominent on social media, I don't know who these people are, by the way, right? But it's all these, because what I've learned is not to engage with them. You just waste your energy. So very clearly writing that, you no know, people like, and they name me also, that their OCI, they don't know what, their passport should be canceled, OCI should be canceled, they should be investigated for being pro-Pakistan, they should be investigated for being, you know, whatever. Now, see, if those of you who know the flag, you know, that's a queer flag, LGBTQ, I identify as queer. I'm an atheist person. I have given platform, not only let's say to the Dalai Lama, to Arundhati Roy, right? Uh, to Ch Changa. I've given platform to Mohsin Dawar who speaks for Pashtun Tafur movement in Pakistan. And when I did that, the attack on me from the Pakistani trolls was exactly the same which I would get from the Hindu trolls. And that case I was named as oh, Hindu Indian as Indian agents. I've been called Indian agent. I've been called Pakistan agent. I've been called Mossad agent. I've been called CIA agent. I've not been called MI6 for some reason. I have no idea though I live in England. The reason I highlight all of this is because this, and I, I, you know, we can laugh about it, but I also know that actually there's a threat. 
uh, my access to India, where my family is, can be under threat. My family can be put under pressure. My friends will be put under pressure. The kind of talks I give in India and Indian universities before 2014, you know, I work on Kashmir. I support Kashmiri freedom. And you can see how that can be a tricky one in Indian context, even for secularists, right? With the secularists and the left and the Hindutva agree in terms of India on Kashmir. And my position is very different from them, right? So now, of course, I support Kashmir, I support Tibet, I support Balochistan. You can see how tricky it, that position can be. But that's my position politically. As a queer person, I have no nation, is how I say it. As a queer person, I believe in strongly supporting the rights of all human beings. I support uh, 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 challenging aggression everywhere. Now, on that front, I do believe that we cannot only focus on majority nationals in India and glorify, for instance, Erdogan or glorify Imran Khan or glorify Trump. I'm not, not that we do it, but I'm just saying, right? I believe in challenging majority nationals everywhere. That's not politics. And yet, and yet, I cannot change the fact that where I come from, where my original identity is, which is of a Savarna Hindu Indian, the primary responsibility, in my view, for me is to challenge violence that's done in my name. And the violence done in my name at this point in time in my homeland is a violence done against Muslims, against Christians, against seculars, against communists, but essentially against Muslims. It's quite important that I, like people like myself, we do not give in to the bullies. We do not give a hope, but we keep fighting. And I'm using the word fighting consciously because I don't believe, and I'm using the word F word here, right? F, F dot dot fascism. I'm not using any other word, right? Fascism. Hindutva is a fascism. And I can explain to you why I'm saying fascism. By the way, I'm not saying fascism only in terms of a left-wing propagandist term. I'm saying it as an intellectual. As an intellectual, as a scholar, I'm saying Hindutva is fascism. Now, you may say, but we are not 1930s. We don't have right now Holocaust. We don't have concentration so far, right? I would say India is, of course... I'm using example, we may not go in that direction, but it's likely to be in that direction. We might be, India might be in the situation of 1935 Germany, that they still have opposition parties. The day they will stop, I mean, you know, a lot of Hindutva leaders, they have a fantasy of ending elections. We may think they're, you know, we will have to say, come on, they're freaks. Who cares for them, right? All these uh, sadhus who come up and say that, you know, we have to kill not only Muslims, we have to kill all Muslims. We have to kill all uh, secularists, right? They say it. Remember, right now, we see them as freak. But please, Modi was seen as a far right in the past, and he's seen as a respectable leader today. Yogi Adityanath was seen as a far right, he's seen as, not by me, but not by maybe us, but by many as middle ground. So what has happened in India now, of course, sadly, with the Hindutva, is that they've changed the discourse, changed the comments where, where what was seen as unacceptable becomes acceptable, what was seen as far right becomes the common sense, and what was seen as sensible middle ground is seen as far left. And therefore, I'll end my talk by saying that it's a very depressing picture. I know it's a very depressing picture, but in diaspora, we do have a role not to go quiet in the name of either fear or in the name that, oh, we should not speak away against our country, right? Because our country, I would say, the country I grew up in, the country I would associate with, the country my parents associate with, it, is not the country that is a mod modified India. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dibesh. Uh, Faisal, could you please put uh, Surita's message? Ji. And then after that, we can give the question and answer sessions. Good morning. I'm Sunita Vishwanath, co-founder of Hindus for Human Rights. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. I'm sorry not to be with you in person, but I'm honored to send you my remarks. I'm sure that Professor Manoj Chatterjee and Professor Dibyesh Anand would have given you a detailed, alarming, but true picture of the deterioration of democracy and human rights in India today. I will not give you yet another long list of the atrocities taking place in Modi's India, atrocities towards Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Dalits, and anyone raising their voice in dissent. I will not tell you that Tripura is burning with the fires of anti-Muslim mob violence 
and this in retaliation for the fires of anti-Hindu mob violence across the border in Bangladesh. I will not tell you that some Indians have been thrown into jail just for tweeting Tripura is burning and that the Indian police has asked Twitter to suspend 68 accounts which have tweeted about Tripura, citing India's draconian anti-terror law, the Unlawful Acts Prevention Act, including our own close US-based partner organization, Indian American Muslim Council, you know all this already. I won't tell you about the hundreds of pro-democracy activists, students, journalists, protesters against the anti-Muslim citizenship law, the CAA, who have been in jail for months, if not years, even though there is no evidence of any crime they have committed. I won't tell you about Father Stan Swami, one of India's brave political prisoners jailed on preposterous fabricated charges of terrorism and sedition, an 84-year-old Jesuit priest with Parkinson's disease, whose entire life was dedicated to serving India's marginalized indigenous communities, who died in state custody in July. You have already wept for Father Stan. And I won't tell you that all these atrocities are taking place under the authoritarian Hindu nationalist regime of Narendra Modi and the BJP and RSS, whose clear and explicitly stated goal is to turn India from a secular democracy into a Hindu Rashtra. You know this too, and hardly need reminding. What I will tell you is that 10 years ago, I started on this path of building a progressive Hindu platform, which stands resolutely against caste and Hindu nationalism, and which is unwaveringly committed to justice and human rights of all people on earth and to protecting our planet. The most important thing that needs to happen to save Indian democracy is that its majority population, the Hindu population, needs to wake up and see what is happening Hindus need to understand that the increasingly frequent newspaper headlines in international media that point out the hatred, the Islamophobia, the violence, the denial of constitution rights, including freedom of expression, the lynchings and rapes of minorities, that these are not disinformation, these are not fake news, this is the reality of today's India. My Hindu community in India and the diaspora needs to realize that the country India is headed in a dark and dangerous direction that will be as bad for Hindus as it will be for anyone else. Because when democracy dies, everyone suffers. It was recently the Hindu holy festival of Diwali or Diwali when we celebrate the victory of good over evil. My prayer, this and every Diwali in recent memory, is for my Hindu community to come to its senses and for the juggernaut of Hindutva, of hateful Hindu nationalism, to be rejected, defeated, slain. My prayer is for my Hindu kith and kin to remember what they have clearly forgotten, that our religion teaches us that we are all one, that the ideal devotee sees the joys and sorrows of another as our own, sees God in the face of every person, regardless of their caste, religion, race, gender, class, and that our ultimate dharma as Hindus is loka sangraha, the well-being of all. We have lost our way, mired in hate, violence, and a manufactured sense of victimhood, which conveniently justifies it all. This Diwali, I prayed hard for a return to sanity in India and in the Indian diaspora, a return to democratic and pluralistic values, rule of law, and protection of minorities. Many of us in Hindus for Human Rights went to community and family Diwali functions and gatherings, Diwali greetings were exchanged in our family and community WhatsApp and Telegram groups. What we realized this Diwali is that in our Hindu spaces, 
people have still not woken up to the horror that is underway in India. While Time Magazine proclaimed that India is an, on its way to an anti-Muslim genocide, Diwali was celebrated in our family and community spaces as if absolutely nothing's wrong, with no acknowledgement of the crisis, with no prayer for peace. This Diwali, it dawned on me that we will need to ready ourselves for a fight that may take decades rather than years and things may get worse before they get any better. We know that the Hindu right is growing in power and reach here in the United States. Our colleagues in the UK, Europe, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, they tell us that the same is happening in their countries as well. All of us in our coalitions of pro-democracy organizations and advocates are working incredibly hard to raise global awareness of the crisis of democracy in India. And we must continue our efforts, undaunted by the public shaming and trolling, the personal attacks and threats, and even lawsuits. Even if we are the side with few numbers, we must be strong in our conviction and speak for pluralism, peace, and the rights and the safety of minorities. And even if there are risks, we in the diaspora must use our voice to boldly raise awareness of the plight of India's Muslims and other minorities. When one of us is attacked, we have all been attacked. We must unite as one to defend each other. We must also speak up for the oppressed minorities in other countries in South Asia. It was extremely heartening to see so many non-Hindu groups speak up against the mob violence against Hindus that took place in Bangladesh recently. Many of you know that my colleague Raju and I are among those who have been sued by a Hindutva aligned organization, the Hindu American Foundation. It is very telling that the group that has been sued consists of two Hindus, a Muslim, a Christian, and a scholar. They have attacked exactly what we are fighting to save, the secular fabric of India. I believe in my core that the best thing we can do to fight this force of hate and division is to cling together and refuse to be divided. Muslim, Hindu, Christian, Sikh, Dalit, atheist, scholar, student, teacher, all of us united in our glorious diversity and our commitment to an India and a world where the rights of each one of us is sacrosanct. Thank you. So you see, this is what is the problem for Modi. So long such voices are there, even if they are maybe less in number, but they are a very big potential force. So this is what we are trying to build, at least in diaspora. And as you said that there is a strong civil society in India and they are not scared. Uh, whether they are being put in jail or whatever, but it's still the fight is going on. Of course, these are bad times. Uh, so that's how we, we achieve certain thing. We get more awareness, make more coalitions, and hopefully things are going to be better, if not in the near future. So before we go to question and answer, uh, here is next week's uh, uh, talk. Um, by a very, very famous professor from India. I think one of the best known economists in India. Uh, he's far in the left, <laughs> Professor Parbhat Patnaik. And he is going to be introduced by Professor Akil Bilgrami of Columbia University, uh, as well as Professor, uh, and concluding remarks will be given by uh, Professor Akbar Noman, who is also in Columbia. Um, so, uh, hopefully, this will be a very interesting talk. And thank you so much, Debesh Saab, um, Sunita, and um, Manojit Saab uh, for taking time and giving us insightful, you know, uh, information and inspiration. Let us move to the question and answer session that will be moderated by my colleague, Dr. Rafat Hussain. 
and over to Rafat. Thank you, Razi Bhai, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And thank you to Shanti, and thank you to Professor Anand for a brave and powerful talk without mincing any words, and Professor Chatterjee for introducing the speaker, and for Sunita Vishwanath for the recorded message. So there are two options to ask the question. You can raise your digital hand or uh, show your interest in the chat box that I have a question. And uh, please uh, write in uh, Urdu, uh, in English, so professor can understand and read it. So I already have a couple of people lined up. And the first one is um, uh, Dr. Nazir Ahmed, please. And after that, uh, Professor Naqvi. So please be ready. Nazir Ahmed, sir. My question relates to a historical myth. The myth of a political majority in India, which has been so carefully hoisted on our consciousness that it has taken on a reality of its own. Gandhi was a principal player in this development. It was at the Round Table Conference of 1931 that he played his first gambit, claiming that the Dalits were a part of a political Hinduism, although they were excluded from the four Varnas and they enjoyed separate representation under the British. At that time, the Muslims were about 25% of British India's population. The Dalits were about 21%. The caste Hindus were a bare majority. The Christians, six, and the others were the rest. Gandhi insisted that the Dalits should not, not have separate representation. And upon his return from London, he started his fast unto death unless Ambedkar caved in and recognized the Dalits as part of a Hindu political majority. The Pune Pact of 1932 was a triumph for Gandhi and for political majoritism in India. What is astonishing, astonishing is that none of the principal players on the other side, the Aga Khan, the Ali brothers, Muhammad Ali Jinnah or Allama Iqbal objected to this Gandhian grand play. My question is this, with the rise in caste consciousness in modern India, will the myth of majoritarianism fizzle out or will it consolidate itself with the toxic glue of Hindutva and sustain itself with anti-Muslim rhetoric? Uh, thank you so much for a very important comment and question both, right? So comment, uh, for, again, for those who may not be aware, is largely to an extent, to what extent Hindus are actually a majority. So not only political majority, but even majority. So if we take the first and second census of India in 1860s and 1870s, there was the whole idea of where would what became the, uh, the those who were seen as untouchables and the Dalits, where would they fit in? Initially, in fact, the Savarna Hindus did not want to see them as Hindus. But over time, and this is this is what the logic of uh, modernity can do, and this is what the logic of divide and rule and what the British were doing is that basically for a very small number of seats, Hindus and Muslim elite both. Hindu elite, Muslim elite are competing. Then the uh, idea that, okay, we want to have a majority. So how can you have majority? You want to have more and more people. So what the Hindu leaders of Congress do is they start, and Gandhi played a very crucial role, is to start saying, oh, the Dalits belong to us, Harijans is what they call them, right? Belong to us. And we know that this was a very contested thing with the Dr. Ambedkar, but he was blackmailed into the situation where Dalits now become seen as Hindus. Now, and that's when initially during my lecture I talked about how Hindu nationalists are not, they don't spring out of nowhere. You know, there were aspects of the so-called secular nationalism that also had Hindu uh, Hindu nationalist elements, right? So that was very much there. And Gandhi was part of it. Of course, in that context, also, if you take an example of Indian constitution, when they talk of Indic religion, they usually talk of uh, Hinduism, they talk of Jain, Buddhist, but they don't have Islam and Christianity. So in a way, what Hindutva does is follows on from what the secular nationalists did, which is to see Muslims and Christians essentially as foreign bodies. Right? So that's it. Now, in terms of the two trends, you're right, uh, uh, Professor, in terms of uh, what happens with, with Dalits and the uh, Savarna Hindus, 
Now, Brahminism has been a very powerful force over centuries and a very, it's not a rigid force. If it was rigid, it would crash and collapse. It has been a very sly force, as I say sly deliberately, you know, very sly, very flexible and maneuvering and taking on board and uh, uh, spewing it out. So what's happening, if you look at it, is there's a growing Ambedkarite consciousness amongst many Dalits. So if that increases, you would have a situation where this whole idea of Hindu being majority will be challenged. But, and there's a big but here, if you also have amongst many Dalits, them being used against Muslims and them seeing Muslims as a problem rather than Savarna Hindus as a problem. So what the Savarna Hindutva forces are doing is playing the colonial game of divide and rule. So uh, I remember a few years ago when, you know, Rohit Vemula, who, uh, who you know, who died by suicide a few years ago in Hyderabad University, I had met him a few days before he died. I mean, I'd gone for my talk on Kashmir um, and yeah, I met him. He was on a hunger strike there along with others. So when I spoke to him and I also observed them, what I felt was there was a strong possibility and hope of solidarity between Ambedkarites, Muslims, and progressives. And that was seen as a danger by the vice chancellor and other there, and therefore they wanted to break it. Because if you have a you can't have Dalit Muslim unity because Dalits also are Muslims also divided around Savarna and non-Savarna lines. And we know that you know the situation of Pasmanda Muslims are not the same as the situation of Ashraf Muslims. So there's also division there. So if anti-caste consciousness, and you not caste, but anti-caste consciousness in India becomes stronger, you will not only have a challenge to Hindutva, it will also have challenge to the secular nationalism and secular imagination of Hindus as a majority. You will also have challenge to the Ashraf domination, the Muslim, you know, the upper caste Muslim domination of Muslim politics. So the way we understand the communal politics of India is a Hindu versus Muslim, which is broadly the secular politics, right? And how Muslims and Hindus need to work together, even that will be challenged. Because many Pasmanda activists argue that this whole Hindu versus Muslim focus takes away from the fact that most victims, most of the time, are lower caste Muslims, lower caste Hindus, and uh, non-caste Hindus, right? Now, my reading, I mean, my reading, and this is my reading, I, I may be wrong, is that if we take example of what's happening in recent years with Modi, and this is why Modi becomes a very important figure for them. Modi being an OBC is not insignificant. Hindutva have been partially successful in demonizing Muslims so much that Dalits and even to an extent tribals, sometimes, even if not politically, but in terms of consciousness, would start seeing Muslims as a problem before they would see the Savarna Hindus as a problem. So which direction we go to in India, I don't know. Which direction we should go to, I definitely know. But which direction we might go, I, I, I don't have an answer to that. But this does imply that Ambedkarite consciousness is very important. Rather than looking at Dalit politics, we have to look at Ambedkarite politics because they're not always the same. Thank you, Professor. The next person is uh, Kaiser Nakhvi and uh, Mahatashim Sayyid after that. Uh, Kaiser Nakhvi, sir, please unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, uh, greetings to everybody. I hope I'm audible. Uh, okay. Professor, first, I've got three points. First, I must congratulate you. You did a very enlightening, very interesting, and very knowledgeable lecture. Thank you very much for that. Number two is that, you know, the rise of Hitler had a lot of do, uh, had an economic background. The German nation was beaten in the First World War and with a lot of inflation and all that, you know, everything. So, but the, then Hitler built on that and blamed the Jews for creating this economic unrest and all that. And out of that as a uh, outcome was that, that the Aryans are the most superior race and the master race concept and all. So it's a, like the economic thing that was the driving force behind it. I would like to ask uh, you to answer on that, number one. Number two is my question is, in, the, in India is known by Hindustan or by Bharat. And third is India. India, of course, comes from Indus, but Bharat and Hindustan are pure, typically Hindu okay, leaning, inclining words. So uh, why do you think uh, that is the underlying the basis of India? What is that? Can you focus on these two points, please? Uh, thank you again. I got the uh, got the point, and thanks again for your compliment. And also for the you know when one of you I think it was Razi who said you know a very brave uh, talk to me and Sunita and uh, Manuji. I mean, honestly, just think of it. Would ten years ago you would have called the same speech brave? 
would 20 years ago you'd have called the same speech brave possibly not right and but that itself tells us and you know that itself tells us how the situation is changing and i also come to the questions by the way there was someone who wrote a question in the or comment in the chat right saying yeah. that would i have been able to give the same talk if i was based in india right i can yeah. it was me it was me oh, okay yeah right in india not only have i given these talks these kinds of talks in india you know and i have given talks i have been invited to give talks in india i have given lecture on azadi and kashmir at jnu by the way at the same time when the controversy happened but and there's a big but by now in last 2 to 3 years things have changed so after 2014 it started changing so for instance i was giving a talk at tis starting the social sciences bombay then iit bombay on kashmir forget hindutva na on kashmir in both cases there was a last minute attempt to shut down the event but the event went ahead because students mobilized and we did it i did the event so what was for me a non controversial intellectual thing became a controversial political thing and what happened after that is of course you know it is no longer in white if i give a talk on queering the nation most people don't get it and i will be allowed or because all yeah. my work in china and i'll be allowed but you're right if i was in india i would not be in this position possibly because i would be censored by now i would have all kinds of disciplinary against me and i would not be head of school possibly right that's how it is now coming back to the questions two things in terms of hindustan bharat and india right but we also where does the whole idea of hind and hindu come from and we know that even that is not a how do they that's not a savarna hindu term so the idea of hindustan in the past was the land which is there and of course the land that was there it was a geographical category rather than a religious category so hindu or hinduism i mean very fact of hinduism means that it's not in hindu term right it's not an indian term it's an english term hinduism hinduism gets formed in 19th century where in british imagination there's islam which they think they know there's christianity which they think they know so the rest are classified as hindus and the census politics of kenneth jones work around the 1860s and 1870s census work is very important because he talks of how hindu and hindu becomes a residual category those who are not muslim not christian not jews not whatever are the hindus and then of course the hindus start identifying themselves as hindus and i come my parents uh, were in jharkhand ranchi area right jharkhand eastern india and in jharkhand area you know, majority of tribals adivasis follow what's called sarna faith now there's no one sarna religion there are all kinds of sarna religion but of course for many savarna hindus that's hinduism because you're worshiping goddess you're worshiping nature therefore that's hindu except for adivasis that's not hindu so what hin savarna hindus have done is they have sort of colonized and hegemonized even sarna religion and trying to make it as their own though even it's not their own so they have been successful there so i would say essentially that other than bharat hindus hindustan everything it depends upon who appropriates it so what the hindutva is doing they appropriating it for a particular imagination of india as essentially hindu and in their head it's savarna hindu led though they will have dalits and others also but savarna hindu led and the very important question which you raised about but and there is a difference so hitler came to power at a time where germany had experienced humiliation economic crisis and a political weimar republic in germany was politically quite how to say unstable right that's how it was but are we can we talk of the same in terms of hindutva given hindutva comes in 1990s 2000 and 2010s when indian economy was doing much better there is no economic crisis per se right and i would say but the similarity and this is where ultimately the com- whatever the reason for many people supporting majority in nationalism ultimately there is a strong sense of victimization felt by a significant section of majority so a sense of victimization felt by the majority so the majority people see themselves as insecure as hurt as humiliated as being suppressed and that was common in germany that's common in uh, you know uh, in india now that's common in turkey where majority people start seeing that we have been suppressed by these secular uh, uh, secular turks rather than the islamist turks they do that uh, uh, trump that white people are being victimized by these you know hispanics and the black people and the, you know the leftists and progressives there's a victimization so commonality is a victimization now of course in case of hitler the use is made of you are experiencing xyz because of the jews you experiencing all of this because of your democracy you are experiencing this because of your liberal party you know all of that in case of hindutva you see again this something similar that you are experiencing not the growth that you need because of corruption 
somehow and you know anna hazare played a very dodgy and dangerous role by the way right anna hazare even uh, uh, kejriwal so the image of congress as very corrupt of course congress was very corrupt but so is bjp very corrupt in fact if i would say that on many terms possibly they all corrupt right yeah i'm sure mayawati is corrupt party the all parties are very corrupt but hindutva corrupts the entire soul of india not that i believe in soul but you know rhetorically speaking soul of india and hindutva is the corruption of the entire idea of democracy and right? others are only monetarily corrupt now but at least in corrupt terms so what happens is and this is why if you look at hindutva the support base is significantly middle class upper middle class that's the leadership and support base because they believe that even though they're doing well they could do even better and get more respect if only india was strong but how will india become strong only if it's led by a strong leader but how can you have a strong leader only if you have a hindu leader hindu samrat like uh, modi so a colleague of mine dr nitasha call she wrote a, an article recently on a few years ago on she termed hindutva as in terms of um, post colonial neoliberal nationalism so combination of neoliberal and post colonial we should therefore see the uh, links there right and she also recently i'll put the link later on the misogyny part of it the misogyny playing a crucial role so i would say of course there's a difference in terms of economic background but the similarity remains that the majority those who are the powerful see themselves as victims of other things and therefore they look up and look out for a leader who's going to show the minorities their real place and create a strong majority nation thank you professor uh marcham uh, next thank person you. Is... thank you thank you welcome uh mohit shim sayed please and after that sayed amir sahab mohit shim sahab please unmute yourself let me see if he's there yeah he's there okay go ahead please you are unmuted please go ahead i think he's saying things but um yeah mm, i don't know why okay i will come back to you so no. next person is uh, sayed amir sahab thank you uh, and thank you professor anand i like your talk a lot although it's a little causing little unease and a little scary um since you are an um, intellectual professor in in the academic world i want to ask you to address a little broader question um the values sublime values like um pluralism um like tolerance international cooperation seem to have very short shelf life um in india for example i mean i was growing up in india and uh, in the 50s and at those times a small place in uttar pradesh diwali was a festival i look forward to all year because all the sweets i was going to get and it was celebrated jointly by hindus and muslims and there was really such a sense of jubilation um now what happened is mahatma gandhi and pandit jawaharlal nehru their lofty ideals sublime values of all this which i mentioned and um, for a while health so in india and india become briefly uh, almost like a conscience of the world but they did not last um, as soon as well, of course uh, mahatma gandhi was taken away very soon after independence and pandit jawaharlal nehru did infuse a lot of uh, value of secularism and or intolerance but it, the values did not last so makes you wonder is not a, a a problem of india is there something intrinsic is there something default values are this is what we are seeing in modi's india and it can only be um, postponed for a while with lofty personality like nehru and mahatma gandhi for a while and when as soon as it is relaxed it defaults back to this, what is um, what we see now yeah go ahead okay yeah in fact i'll respond to that and should i also respond to the questions in the chat yeah i am taking care of them 
Oh, you will take care of them, okay? No, I will. I, I will ask them to ask you the question. Oh, okay, directly. some of them are direct question to me. I noticed that's fine. Then I'll let you ask that. Otherwise, I've noted. Take a note. Again, in terms of values, I mean, look, if I say I don't have an answer to this. All I would say is, we while great leaders are important, right? Be it Nehru or I'm not. I don't see Nehru, uh, Modi as great, but you know, great means this is like great in politics, right? Ultimately, the values that evolve in the society are not products of the leaders alone so what the leaders do of course is sometimes lead the way but sometimes they f- almost reflect what's happening in the society and if you look at any society not only indian society is there are always contestations so i would argue that cultures for instance are sites of contestation they're not sites of agreement the site centers of contest which imply that it is onus is on all of us all the time i know it's hard work but onus is on all of us all the time to explore values that are more inclusive debate for those values fight against those who challenge those values and somehow survive so i would say if you look at the entire part of history we have ups and downs and there's no linear movement and i don't believe that ultimately we are going to worse direction better direction in indian context i think we worse direction right now but at this point in time and someone also asked me where is the source of hope the hope lies in humanity humanity has survived so far hopefully will survive unless there's a climate crisis also you know what happens with that we don't know but in terms of we cannot give up hope because if we give up hope then what's left is that what i would say okay. thank you um acham sayyed saab are you back but let's move to sayyed hussain or abdul jabbar sir i think uh, let's move on uh, next uh, person is satinath choudhry please no actually i couldn't hear dr debesh what he was saying choudhry saab satinath yeah. choudhry please okay um yeah my um, basic question was um um what is the solution what do you see as the solution and just a small uh thing um, what did you can you explain um, what is ambedkar right um politics and how does it differ from dalit politics okay thank you for that i mean again it's a very in, if you have to put that dalit politics has a range of politics which is about accepting dalits as equal human beings accepting that dalits have to assert themselves in elections in order to gain some rights because economically socially they are marginalized right so dalit politics and range from being part of even bjp to get recognition there or bsp bahujan samaj party kind of politics mayawati politics where that you vote as a dalit you vote separately and you can go with whichever party you want to go with and the ambedkarite politics is a particular kind of dalit politics which argues that hinduism cannot be a solution Because remember, even Ambedkar left Hinduism. He said, "I know I may be born, but I'm not going to die a Hindu. He turned into Buddhist. He did not turn into Muslim or Christian because he felt that both Islam and Christianity also have particular problems, right? So he turned Buddhist. So Ambedkarite politics is one that's about political consciousness raising. They don't believe that the solution is only elections. So the Dalit politics, in general, if you look at BSP kind of model, is mostly about election and winning elections, right? And surviving through that, which is important, but not the only thing. Ambedkarite politics is also about raising consciousness and recognizing that elections are not the only way. And in terms of where does optimism come from? So, oh, so what's the solution? Well, our the solution is let's keep challenging. And what Sunita said earlier that let us not allow Hindutva and pro-Hindutva and the soft Hindutva to hegemonize us, but let's challenge them. Now we might be. I always say this to my students also. But look, we might be thinking and imagine living in England with Brexit. and all kind of boris johnson kind of government we always feel you are sinking in this island right but what i said even if you're sinking let's kick and scream while we sink rather than just give up is how i would say but you know keep fighting i would say fight yeah thank you um the next person is soel farooqi loan sir and after that abdul jabbar uh... go ahead please very much sir for a very good discussion on in feminism in democracy in india i have a very uh-huh. uh, brief question for you recently there is a statement from general uh, between rahul in india indirectly he said that uh, lynching there should be a lynching of militants 
in uh, Kashmir and Jammu and Kashmir. And isn't it this that they are no now officially you know supporting the lynchings throughout India and uh, mainly in Kashmir also that people will lynch militants. That means also that they are also supporting the lynchings that is happening all over India. Thank you very much. Again, yeah, so for those, you know, the basic Bipin Rawat, who was, you know, the military leader, he said recently that, I don't know where he got this from, because we haven't heard of uh, people in Jammu Kashmir lynching uh, resistance uh, militants. So anyway, he argued that uh, he had heard that people in Jammu Kashmir are willing to lynch militants, and that's a good thing. They should be lynching them, right? Now, think of it. A military leader supporting lynching. And the reason for him is, of course, because Remember, this is the same military leader who had supported the idea of use of human shield by an Indian soldier for Kashmiri, where a Kashmiri who had actually voted in Indian elections, in a particular election led by India, was put and used as human shield. So we're dealing with a particular ideology, a militarist and militant ideology, and I'm using militant deliberate for the military leader, a militarist ideology where civil society, human rights organizations, those who claim for rights, are anti-national and they deserve to be punished. Now, what happens? And of course, according to him, remember when he's a terrorist, he essentially means anyone who resists India and Kashmir. So the idea is that we should be lynching them. So when you have a when you have a prime minister who presides over, who presided as a chief minister over pogrom of Muslims, when you have a prime minister and the home minister who in fact celebrate and interact a lot with and, and even you know, sort of congratulate people, uh, put, make the ministers, people who celebrate lynching. When we've got people who lynch and then join mem as a member of parliament, why should we be surprised that all the, I'm being blunt here, stooges of these political parties. So military leader is a military leader, but he has no dignity as a military leader. He has no dignity, no shame as a military chief. He's behaving like a typical, you no, know, yes sir, ha sir, you know, the, the chaplusi type. Behaving and trying to appeal to the uh, the the supremo, because India at this point in time, and I've written it I'll say that in is in the situation of one leader, one party, one nation. That's what they're building. The multiple parties, but they're building toward that one leader, one party, one nation, and that's a Hitler example. Thank you. Uh, then uh, Abdul Jabbar Saab. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a great uh, presentation, conversational style. Uh, I have a question on the chat box, but I think that is okay if you want to address that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so the, the the other one I wanted to uh, ask you, because recently, uh, a couple of days ago, I read an op-ed by Comey Cooper. Uh, uh, what is the name? Uh, it's a very, uh, inter uh, very well-known opinion uh, writer in the uh, Indian Express. Uh, basically, she was uh, saying the Congress party as a dynastic uh, uh, element in the political scene is, a, is an impediment for any progress uh, for secular India, because that is the BJP is uh, using that uh, dynastic uh, rule for more, more than 50 years. Uh, that uh, became a uh, uh, Currently, uh, I think based on uh, uh, their rise to the power, uh, partly based on uh, uh, the <laughs> dynastic, uh, you know, they always uh, criticize that. You know, that is their element, you know, uh, past element. How do you, how do you see that? Again, thank you very much. And I'll do this plus the other question you put. The other question you put in the chat was around end round of the Hindu, uh, the ex Hindu now, who talked of how. Uh, that basically it's not good to compare Hitler with Modi. That's what he said. Now, N. Ram, for those of you who know, he's a left wing figure. He has talked about how the Modi poses a danger to Indian democracy, the kind of argument I make. But N. Ram is also, and I have to say, N. Ram is one of the person I have very little uh, respect for. He's someone who is more Beijing than Beijing itself when it comes to Tibet. He has all kinds of odd politics, which is of a typical party left in India. I said party left because party left in India has very little concern with actual progressive values. They're, they're quite problematic. Now, coming back to Hitler, many people on the left, I think it's not only him, in CPM also reject the equation of Modi with Hitler or Hindutva with fascism. Because I would argue, and this I'm, I'm making this argument, right? even amongst the left in India, 
there is this closet in there in closet right you know they hidden but there's almost an unsaid sense of hindu exceptionalism see so i'm saying that even the secularists in there many of them have a particular sense of hindu exceptionalism that we are hindus and then we are indians there you know, India is exception. India cannot be like Germany. We are ultimately why why can't India be like uh, Germany? Because we are Hindu majority. So what? Because Hindus are never united. Hindus are all caste, all faith. You know, one part worships Ram, another part worships Ravan. You know, all of that. So there's this whole, I would say, an unconscious and sometimes conscious sense of Hindu exceptionalism where Hindus and hence Indians are seen as pluralist by nature. and therefore even if hindutva is there it can never become like nazism so i would say in fact that says that reflects a closet sense of hindu exceptionalism amongst even the left that's how it is now in terms of uh, congress and the argument that you know it's essentially congress failure so long as congress is around it's dynastic and therefore there's no alternative my position i don't buy into that argument by the way now i'm also critic of congress i mean look at congress uh, forget other thing look at what congress did with sikhs anti sikh pogrom in 1984 right i mean what modi did is what uh, happened under congress in 1984 congress has its own flaws dynasty politics has its own flaws but how long let's say we know how ineffective congress has been in recent years right but is there any evidence that other political parties third front fourth front fifth front you know communists uh, what that they have been better at national scale not at state level at national scale to provide an alternative to bjp not really so what i would say this whole uh, you know saying that if somehow congress is not there in the picture or congress is less dynastic there will be solution takes away from this uh, takes away from the fact that bjp is no ordinary party bjp is not a political party only it is a political party of course but it's not a political party per se bjp is the political front of a fascist organization rss which no other organization has so see bjp can disappear one day but what would happen is and and but rss is not going to disappear so because of the cultural and social transformation that rss has brought about in india the bjp is the front for them and as a front and remember if you paid attention remember for since 2014 sometimes you'll read about how modi is showing vhp its place modi has sidelined togadia modi has sidelined singhal modi has sidelined xyz you'd hear it from nana but then every year modi and amit shah and others go to uh, rss to then give a sort of a report on what the government is doing by the way Modi had never separated from RSS. Modi is RSS, and the reason why the propaganda that somehow Modi is going to control RSS, which is backward, was meant to reassure middle ground Indians, Hindu Indians in particular, that if they vote for Modi, they're not voting for those you know lumpen fascists. They're voting for the Modi who's going to bring about some kind of development in India. that was a propaganda and that's a propaganda they used from time to time that's a propaganda also which a lot of hindu indians i would say but also some muslim indians have interacted with those who uh, think oh it's okay yeah what happens bad but you know modi they keep bringing something i don't know what modi is bringing to india economically but that's the narrative they use so coming back to it i don't believe that uh, dynastic politics is a key problem here it's a fascist politics of fascism that remains a key problem if sidelining of congress is going to lead to rise of other forms of secular party is great for it but so long as i mean at this point i don't see that as uh, possible thank, thank you, you. razi bhai the questions keep coming how how long you wanted to go and uh, um let me ask uh, professor anand also there uh, are uh, four five, four okay. five people maybe we can go for next 15 minutes we then have to go out okay later. great thank you so that's what i wanted to know okay. uh, sayyad hosain sa and please be brief and uh, um, i request uh, anand saab also yeah. please uh, so yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> i will be definitely brief because uh, my question is very simple that for economic development you go to find the talent uh, whether is muslim or christian or hindu or that and india rightly aspires to be world power or economic power like uh, part of g8 
So how can he, uh, I mean, uh, these two things which uh, are not uh, in line with each other, how can uh, a, a country or a people, uh, which are very intelligent people also in India, that uh, you want to be economic power and you are not uh, having the whole country behind uh, this uh, dream uh, is possible? That's my question. Yeah, thanks. So what I would say is look, the whole uh, idea of that we want to be a great power, right? You take example of China. China, the whole idea of national dream, you know, the, the, the nationalist resurgence and Chinese dream. It is growth is seen as secondary to respect. So the notion like in Chinese context is that we are growing, but we are not getting respect from the outside world. And same is the case in case of Hindutva, which is that they do want economic growth. They want all of this, but essentially what they want is recognition and respect. So what Modi has been successful and the Modi experiment has been successful at and that started with Gujarat is presenting where there will be some economic growth for some, maybe even for many, not a lot, right? But there'll be economic growth or not. That's immaterial. What matters is it says that Indians are being recognized as powerful. So why would Modi come to US, UK and elsewhere and go for you know, the Texas kind of thing? You know, they go for big things. Why, why, why is it important? It's important because those appearances of Modi Wait, be it in Wembley here or wherever in the US, is then relayed back in India by media to show that, look, Modi is, Modi ji ko sab log pyar karte hai. Modi ji respected there, right? Modi ji, Modi ji respected there. The notion is uh, that, therefore, those in India who do not respect Modi are somehow anti-national. You see, so the whole idea is a very much a propaganda game that they're playing. You're right. I mean, if they were more inclusive generally, if they were not killing Muslims here and there, you know, doing this love jihad, you know, what a UPSC jihad, love jihad, biryani jihad. I mean, if there's anyone, I have to say, if there's anyone who's most creative and obsessive about jihad, I can't imagine ISIS being that creative. It is essentially the Hindu people, right? They're always about jihad. I'm sure we are part of jihad in some case, right? Maybe it's a Zoom jihad, they'll call it, right? Yeah. Uh, no, respect. So essentially what they want is respect and they believe that with a strong leader, we'll get respect. And it's an ecosystem, by the way. Many of them know it's not happening. But because they start believing and the trolling is, remember we had talked earlier of trolling sometimes before they talk. Trolling is because this whole investment in social media and media to create a certain image where essential ideas, yes, India might not be doing great, does not matter, Pakistan is doing worse. India is not do doing great, but it's better than Nehru, right? India is not doing great, but that's because of anti-nationals. So that's what they're investing in. So Thank you. The question is not uh, uh, this uh, uh, division, but the, uh, the economic development is secondary, respect is primary. That's what you are saying? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Arvind Ansari Saab. And after Thank that, you. Uh, Thank somebody you. by name, iPhone. <laughs> Okay. okay. Thank, th thank you very much. And Professor Dibishis, it was very thought-provoking lecture. And in your lecture, you have pointed out that you have um, hope from electoral democracy. But in this heightened atmosphere of polarization, and uh, you know, you yourself in the previous answer said that there is no alternative. Aap logon ke paas jaiye after this failure of complete health uh, structure in India pandemic, still you talk to people in uh, UP, they say, who else? Who is there? So, you know, and the <clears throat> middle class, which is so, you know, busy with uh, making their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, needs meet, they are not uh, having that opportunity. So what do you think? What is going to be the political future of India in 2024? I wish... Uh... I, I know that uh, this, this pandemic phones, right? I mean, the second... First, yeah, it was very bad. It was very bad. Yes. Okay. First yeah. wave, you could still excuse they were caught by me. Second wave was essentially a Modi phenomenon, I would say. It. I yeah. mean, I, I lost my dad in my during the second one. I couldn't even go. My, I lost but my still, dad. Yes. My yes. Suffering. And, and I remember speaking to my dad was uh, like me, very critical of Modi, but he's also an old generation of uh, Indians who had no respect for him, you know, Modi kind, and would not be shy in criticizing him. But in the last few years of him, I had to say to him that, can you not say anything in public? Because what would happen is go and walk around in Ranchi and say to him, Modi ko kya vote karte hai? Modi to chor hai. You know, he'll say those things. 
Now he could say it, but I could see the faces of people, and they would almost like you know because he's elderly and you know middle class, upper middle class. They respected him, but I could see that the people hated even people who were not benefiting from Modi. So you're right, and therefore when I say electoral democracy is a possible hope, I'm not saying that it's a clear answer. Because one of the challenge, of course, is with even if you look at uh, uh, what's his name, Kejriwal, and others, they become oh, yeah. more <laughs> nationalist. So we live in a situation where even if BJP loses the election, the terrain has shifted to an extent where the common sense change that RSS brought about is almost already always there. But take example of DMK in uh, Tamil Nadu. That's I'm going to other provinces in South India in particular. You do have alternative to BJP there, right? So what I would say at this point in time that what else? I mean, I have not, if I have to hold on to hope, the only hope I can hold on to is possibly electoral democracy. Possibly there were people maybe in three years, five years, ten years time that they're not going to eat that round temple that's going to be built for them, right? They're not going to eat Modi's speech somewhere that they need to eat something, hopefully. So hope that's my hope. But it's not based on, I have to say, it's not based on scholarly uh, certainty. Thank you. So there are two more people and then we will end up. Um, iPhone uh, by the name iPhone. Somebody had two questions. Yes, this is uh, Joya Roy. I told you I am coming out as iPhone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, although I I registered for you and by oh, okay. my name. So, so please go ahead. Actually, uh, the, the second question I had, in which I put my name, was that I don't think Modi and BJP were really elected. Because uh, I think the EVMs have all been rigged. Why else would he have this Gujarat I IAS, a failed Gujarat IAS as ECI? You know, tell him to get one from like a session from Tamil Nadu and see what happens to the EVMs. Because, you know, there were 2 million EVMs which were missing in an RTI, an RTI filed in, in Mumbai, uh, in Mumbai, uh, in the 2000 and 2019 elections, that 2 million, 20 lakhs were missing. And the ECI said in the RTI that it had no idea where they were. The three suppliers uh, who supply the machines uh, gave the numbers supplied and the ECL didn't have those 2 million. And in my locality in uh, Kalkadi, in um, Great Kalash, in Delhi, there were so many reports of people nearby, which is a very strong uh, Punjabi refugee colony, you know, Kalkaji. All these people who came from Pakistan, you know, they're, they're very, that's where Advani's Ratyata started in Delhi. So they're very terrible, uh, terribly Hindutva types. And there were so many EVMs Jaya, that found please, in people's please, houses uh, there. Come to the question, please. Jaya. Yeah, so the, the question is, why do you say these people were elected? Okay, thanks. Now, of course, exactly how much was rigging, how much was not rigging, we, I mean, in a way, we cannot assert, but we cannot deny the fact that, let's say, even if parts of election were rigged, because if you take example, at state level, BJP did lose election in many places. In many places have lost election when all the polls predicted they'll win. So if, if, therefore, if EVM control was absolute in their hand, they would not have lost those elections, that's number one. And Let's say, even if they rigged here and there and got more votes than ever, we cannot deny the fact that they are popular. I'm not saying they're 150% plus, but they are immensely popular political parties and they did win election by hook or crook. So I'm not saying that basically it's a legitimate election, or but fact is, at various points in time, they could, they are those, but okay. If we see them as only illegitimate, then we take away from the fact that there are there are significant number of population in India who support them in every sphere. And therefore, for me, a more fruitful way out is to look at why would people support them? What's the ideology behind it? What's the common shaping? What are the key factors? And I come back to RSS. And then what can we as anti-Hindutva people do to transform the common sense to then have an impact on electoral democracy? Okay. Uh, since uh, uh, iPhone and Joe Roy was the same person, so I gave a chance to one more person and uh, Lone Saab, uh, please ask the question, no background, if you have yeah. something to say. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. Uh, sir, I have a question uh, that uh, Professor Devesh Anand said that 
I have hope on electoral politics in India. So uh, we see so much hatred against uh, Muslims going on that uh, mostly the Hindus, they are, you know, uh, hating the Muslims and they are, you know, indulging in, you know, uh, interfering in their religious practices also. We see in the Haryana recently. So how, how would this change if, uh, say, somebody, some other political party wins the elections in 2024? So how would it altogether change that narrative in India? Uh, I'm sad. I don't think it will, tell, it will change altogether. That's the challenge, right? So even if BJP loses the election at national level, I don't think we are going to... I'm, I'm really sad. Not that what we had 20 years ago was great, right? Or 15 years ago was great. But we, there's almost a nostalgia I'm having for what happened 15 years ago. So because common sense and the discourse in India has changed so much that... Even if someone else wins the election, they'll allow, let's say, namaz in Gurugaon somewhere in the public. There'll be constant challenge. So what would happen is Muslims will be told to compromise in order to protect the reputation of the new political party that has come to power. So imagine if Congress or AAP, someone else comes to power. So Muslims will be told that, can you just avoid praying in public? Because if you do it now, then the Hindu is going to mobilize around it and it will weaken the political party. So, exactly. in that, so the disenfranchisement of Muslims is likely to continue to an extent unless unless the coalition or whatever political parties come to power actually come and have the determination to undo some of the damage if not all of the damages that hindutva is bringing about um manoj chatterjee saab has a question so please go ahead chatterjee saab thank you i just unmuted so this is a question which you know you'd expect an economist to ask, which is money speaks a lot in elections, notwithstanding, and I agree with Dibesh, you know, notwithstanding some issues about uh, legitimacy, et cetera, et cetera, we have to accept the election result for what it is, I think. And money plays a big part in, in fighting all elections in modern democracies. And India is no exception. And a yeah. large part of that for BJP has been funded by diaspora Indians, mostly in London mostly in London, possibly less in the US, but in London, it is huge. It also may include people who are very high up in the Tory party, like Priti Patel, you know, who are absolutely the Modi fan. Uh, and since I work as an advisor to the Home Office, I don't know why I've not been fired yet by Priti Patel, but I haven't. Uh, I actually know this for fact, that she is somebody who is very keen and thinks India is going in exactly the right kind of directions. Uh, these are the same people, by the way, you know, if you want to talk about Islamophobia, et cetera. So they also do the same thing. So the question is, how do we change the attitudes of the fairly well-to-do uh, Hindu community in Britain, many of whom are small businessmen, et cetera, they're not people like the Bish and me. We are the minority amongst the Hindu diaspora in Britain without a shadow of doubt. Uh, you know, because we don't have big houses and big cars and high incomes and all the rest of it. How do we change them? Because that is where the money is coming from. And that could make a difference in the next election. I know, Manoj. And, and again, this is such an important question. We need to have another conversation about the role of diaspora and then how to bring about change. You're right. I mean, if you ask my place, this, this is my tiny studio. I'm stuck here and this is all I have, right? Like human beings. And the, generally, the support base for Modi kind of project Many of them Gujarati, but not only Gujarati, but Gujarati, middle, large uh, businesses, and then political parties here. And then during elections here, by the way, even in mayoral election, you had the conservative party saying how you should not vote for Labour Party because Labour had supported resolutions on Kashmir, right? And then Labour Party had to undo that resolution in order exactly. to get vote from India. And by the Labour Party is supposed to be centre and left. So even Labour Party is actually quite dominated to an extent by uh, Indians who have what we would call them, and they are right-wing Indians, right? And of course, Conservative Party is all right, all out far right uh, Indians and others. Are exactly. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. And this is where the challenge lies. This is why I think the events we are doing here, because one could ask, what's the point of doing this event in US or UK? You should do this in India. The point is, given that the funding ecosystem for and the support ecosystem exactly. for in the tour is exactly. global, the resistance to that also has to be global. Exactly. Right? I still have to say, you'd see that academia here still has more critics 
on Hindutva, then but we don't have much impact beyond, right? But we need to be better in academia and to have an impact beyond academia to at least influence the younger generation of uh, Indian diaspora here, if not their parental generation, right? That's how it is. You write money talks and we, people who know know that BJP essentially is one that gets almost 90% of funding now in elections in India. So that's how it is. From here, we had people going, taking flights, going to uh, Gujarat and voting. That much of money, that's very much part and parcel of it. Uh, so we have to negotiate. All I would say is that in UK and US context, if our role is crucial. So that's why I would say, if I have to end with this, is that Razi and uh, the organization, I'm so grateful to you because of what you're doing. You're providing space. I can see to the progressive space, the kind of speakers you get. We need this progressive space to continue here, right? Progressive space that's unashamedly progressive and not be, oh, now we have to get one Hindu right wing to then balance between someone who's a critic of Hindu. So I don't think RSS is never going to invite us, by the way, right? So <laughs> we need to invite them. Because the only option, good fascist is, I, okay, I have to put it, the only good fascist is a fascist that doesn't exist. And therefore, only way to fight fascism is to fight them in terms of ideas and on streets also from time to time, but on ideas. And for ideas, it's important that we create and have our own spaces while they can have their own space and we challenge them. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I can ask a question, quick question. <laughs> so are the Muslims uh, responsible for this entire saga of Hindutva? Because I know you are intellectual, you must have thought about it. You did not bring up that issue. Is it Muslims' own own making or they have failed somewhere? No. And I said no. I'll tell you why no. Because, of course, Muslim politics broadly, there's no Muslim politics in it. They're Muslim politics sticks like in plural. I mean, you've got all kinds of Muslims, all kinds of politics. So you do know that the Kashmiri Muslim politics is very different from Indian Muslim politics. They are at the opposite end, right? Now, Muslim politics their own challenges in terms of conservatism, in terms of misogyny, in terms of patriarchy, in terms of caste. I have no doubt that uh, politics of Muslims in India is not very progressive, even the way Hindu politics are not progressive. However, that's not responsible, that's not even related to Hindu to other eyes. So, most people who are voting for BJP are not victimized, have never been victimized by Muslims. In fact, if you ask them, if you, the surveys have shown, they hardly know any Muslim. They only know maybe Shah Rukh Khan here and there, right? And um, who, I mean, for other, how does it matter whether it's Shah Rukh Khan or Hrithik Roshan? I mean, it doesn't, right? But in their head, it matters. So what I would say, and there was another question maybe to someone else who said that, do you think Hindutva is a response to ISIS, Al-Qaeda kind of thing? It's not. Hindutva is a response essentially at this point in time to the groundwork done by RSS over decades. RSS has existed much before Al-Qaeda or uh, no, ISIS has existed. Now you could say, but is RSS very different from jamaat islami kind of politics? That's a fair question to ask, right? Because both of them have a certain kind of majoritarian idea that our religion is the best. We are the best. We are superior. And anyone who opposes is against the religion and against the nation, wherever they build, right? So what I would say is that the rise of Hindutva in India is autonomous from what Muslims have done. It's completely related to how the politics of Hindu Indians have evolved in response to liberalization, in response to rise of, uh, by the way, anti-caste politics, in response to affirmative action and the Mandal Commission 1990s, all these factors in response to India growing in power but wanting more respect from international community and Muslims are the scapegoats. So if today, if today, Indian Muslims imagine in all kitchen, everyone turns out to be a perfect progressive, right? I'm, I'm progressive, okay. Perfect, because the Hindutva is not progressive, okay. If all Muslims today turn out to be not Islamist, not Muslim of the kind that Hindutva promotes, do you think Muslims will be safe in India? No, they won't. Because the Muslims, that real Muslims, with all the complications and uh, problems, are not the Muslims that Hindutva imagine. Hindutva imagines what in my book, I call the Muslim. The Muslim is a stereotype. So even if a Muslim doesn't go and pray in Namaz, even if a Muslim celebrates all Hindu festivals, even if a Muslim doesn't, then you're declared to be even more dangerous because you're seen as trying indirectly like a crypto-Muslim to convert and fool Hindus. Because ultimately, and I end with this, which is a sad ending, but end with this, what an RSS, what, what an RSS leader said to me, 
and this is when abul kalam was the president of india right i mean abul kalam you can't get more hinduized muslim than abul kalam right and he was there <laughs> and he so, said that, and what he yeah. said was you can't trust any muslim i said but you know you have got these people in including this said no give them 150 years look into the eyes and there's certain vehshiyat savagery in the eye and therefore you know that you can never trust muslim ever that's what was yeah, I, I, i hear that narrative so i my apology to um, moth shyam sayya saab i thought he is having some issues with his mic so moth shyam saab complained that you didn't invite me is the last chance moth shyam saab please go ahead and then and we have to go now moth shyam sayya saab yeah doctor thank you very much razi saab rafat bhai you speak loudly please speaking here you can listen close to mic and hear you but loud uh it's very informative and uh, very valuable uh professor dr dabesh has a lot of information and uh, my question was in chat i put that rss hindu tawa or radical hindus actually i usually say this is because of the reaction of uh, people sometime they shout when saif ali khan uh, gave his first son name jahangir they started saying that maybe the like some moguls they did something bad so or the taliban or any other radical muslim is this the reaction of that yeah okay i good in fact so i just really fast it's not that's a whole one someone gives the son or daughter name tamur or babar or whatever but who cares india is a place where so many people give name hitler I mean, let's not forget that. I mean, so I, I, all I would say is, of all the people, uh, the uh, not of all the people. I should I, I'm not stereotyping, but people have all kinds of names, right? I mean, who, who cares if someone gave name Tamur? That doesn't make any difference. Why would people object? Let's say Babur or Tamur, because oh, so you, this look at this actor. He's giving name to his son, the name of an invader. Okay, invader took place. Invasion took place six hundred years. Who cares? I mean, you were not born then. Not even our forefathers were born then. So why do you care? Because in your imagination, there's some, there's a like connected hurt that six hundred years ago somehow you suffered because someone else came and invaded you. But you know that's a mythical history, not myth. What we call mythical history, mythical history, because neither was neither is Saif Ali Khan. Connected to that link, neither are the people who are objecting to it. But in their imagination, this is somehow celebrating an invader of India. We know that essentially it's a connection. To, the connection, therefore, is with celebration of, or sorry, a certain notion of Indianness and Hinduness that's victimized by Muslims for centuries, and then uh, the British for uh, after that, and therefore now. Going back to uh, 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 Kamina Ranawat, therefore now is the time where we have to challenge not only the invasion but also challenge all Muslims, all Christians, all seculars, all communists, and become truly free. And this is the lethality of it. So I would say, if for instance, if the Saif Ali Khan had given his son the name Ram, can you imagine the controversy? These Hindu people mm-hmm. against him actually for giving the name of Ram. If he has a daughter, he says calls her Lakshmi. Do you think there's a wow, such a nice secular name? They will lynch him to say that he is now misusing the name of a goddess, and that's the problem Muslims in India face. That if they retain certain idea of Muslimness, they accuse of being Islamist. If they do not retain that idea, then they're seen as those who are trying to fool Hindus by pretending to be uh, not Muslim. So there's no escape, and the reason there's no escape from this is because they can, and I, I want to end this with this: they can be no dignified position for Muslims. Christians, leftists, progressives, genuine secularists, and even genuine pluralist Hindus under Hindutva. Hindutva is an alien force for all of them, and I'll end with that. Thank you so mm-hmm. much, uh, Professor Anand. And uh, this concludes uh, uh, the question and answer session. Unless uh, Dr. Razi Raziuddin, who is always given a last. Uh, Uh, opportunity go ahead please raji bhai back to you thank you rafat thank you so much to take care about this is really the hard part controlling <laughs> all this time and uh, people also but anyway uh, well 
um, it's a lot of time passed, two hours almost, yeah, two hours passed, and you you really did engage people very much in spirit as well as in information. Uh, last, a little <clears throat> um, thematic uh, question. Do you think that this all nourishment, in spite of many bad things that we talk about, Muslim nationalism, Hindu nationalism, all that, is this really the, in the core of all these things? Uh, if there was no division of the country based on this majority Muslim or, or the rest, whatever, do you think that this this, there would not have been a Hindutva upsurge or any nourishment because you provide some kind of nourishment. A, a idea creeping into mind of 85% of population, that, oh, you came from outside, you dominated, you ruled a thousand years, then you divided, you gone, and you are still there. So. Is this not a reality? I mean, do, are we shy of facing this question, even coming from a Muslim, um, that, yeah, uh, is, is this not uh, what was uh, a, a very deep wound in the psyche of Indians? Okay. Or is this something that uh, we should uh, do some kind of thing to correct this or to heal the wounds? How to heal this? Uh, thank you, Razi. I mean, what I would say is, let's say the two-nation theory, right? In fact, two-nation theory, if you look intellectually, it's a bankrupt idea. Politically, it was very powerful. Like it divided the, uh, the subcontinent. But if you look at it intellectually, socially, religiously, it doesn't make sense, the two-nation theory. It's very problematic. But I also don't believe in one-nation theory, which is that India was not one nation. So at best, there was a multinational entity that could be created. So, so while I understand the wound of partition can be relevant, but think of people who are lynching Muslims for e e you know, on the accusation of eating beef. Have they experienced partition? No, they didn't. They have never been outside whatever town they have been. So this wound of partition is connected to mythical history. So the whole going back, Taimur, why give name Babar? Why give name Taimur? Why give name Aurangzeb or whatever, right? It's connected to why partition. The fact of the matter is that we have to deal with the current situation. The current situation is that in South Asia, you've got a majoritarian nationalism in Myanmar. The victims are Rohingya Muslims. And it's Buddhist majoritarian. You've got majoritarian nationalism in Sri Lanka, a Buddhist majoritarian, Tamils are the victims. You've got majority nationalism in Pakistan, the victims are Christians, and in this case, all the Shia, but declared as non Muslim, of course, Ahmadis and everyone. In India, we have got the Hindus. So the fact is, the entire region is experiencing a majority nationalism in different forms. Now, had at one point in time, let's say India not been partitioned, what would it be? We don't know. But it could also have meant more of, I mean, I, I don't, because this is a, it's a game, right? We're playing it. It could also have meant not accommodation, not living with each other, but also killing each other even more or competing majority of them in different parts of the country and the overall uh, federal structure failing to handle it. We don't know. So what I would say at this point in time is, you're right. Partition should not be, you know, I'll, I have heard many times uh, some Muslims saying it that, no, Jinnah was right because of what Hindutva is doing. But Jinnah was right, essentially imply that, okay, so fine. At least Muslims had the opportunity to kill Muslims. Uh, so Muslims had the opportunity to kill Hindus and Christians. Unlike in India, where they have, don't have the opportunity. That's what Jinnah was right means. So in my view, Jinnah was not right. Neither Hindutva right. Who's right? We don't know. At this point in time, all we know is we have to survive. We have to survive as fellow human beings. And our role in diaspora is to help people in the South Asia survive by challenging Hindu nationalism, by challenging Muslim nationalism, by challenging Christian, well, there's no Christian nationalism there, but by challenging all kinds of prejudices and all, all kinds of politics there. On that note, we have to end, we have to rush. To the, all, right. all right, thank you so much. And I really appreciate, our, our group appreciates you coming and, yeah. and, you know, enlightening us so much. Thank, thank you, Rav. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so, Professor, uh, Professor Anand. Yeah. I just want to quick, uh, quick 
<laughs> it's bothering me it's bothering me um so will india be declared a hindutva nation in spite of getting 35 to 40% vote is mindset is change i don't think they okay, how would i know but you know uh, is that they, they don't need to do it they would have made it into hindu nation before the declaration but declaration comes later remember even with babri masjid they took decades to turn it from a mosque to a closed mosque then closed mosque to a de facto temple then from a de facto temple to a grand temple which is happening so yeah. i think it's time but that's a direction unless we stop it and we have to stop it is what i would say and okay i want to thank everyone but particularly also professor chatiji thank you so much and i have to rush now thank you so much thank you so much by the way we'll, we'll, we'll talk again maybe in london it was, sometime it was wonderful okay. thank you everyone thank you everyone and dibesh ji and monoji ji will meet again some day again and again and again and if, uh, if i can let you know in advance okay, okay. thank you thank you so yes. that that, that concludes